Hey there y'all, it's PK Beats, returning the wiki trivia series in a new and informal manner. This is a series where I go to the wiki pages of various Smash topics, go down to the trivia section, if there is one, and learn about new and interesting things that I then share with all of you. Rather than structuring this like I did for the character wiki thing, I'm just going to treat this basically the same as my random facts series, where I just talk about topics at random, with loose connections here and there if applicable. And that's why I'm renaming this as Random Smash Wiki Trivia now. Anyways, enough introductions. First, normally there's a chance that if you get hit, you'll drop the item you're carrying. There's a lot of variance in the chance of this happening involving how much damage or knockback you've taken, but for this setup specifically, Mewtwo dropped an item after the second up air, and again after the fifth up air, so, you know, it's not necessarily uncommon. Well, on the general item wiki, it mentions how if you turn on the fixed damage option in training mode, you'll never drop the item you're carrying. And as you can see here, even after dozens of up airs, nothing happens. My imagination tells me this is just because the mechanic of dropping items requires an input of damage taken to calculate whether or not the drop happens, and if fixed damage is on, I guess no damage is calculated? I mean, even that idea feels weird given how the damage taken is still calculated, as you can see by the combo counter. But like, regardless of specifics, the logic behind this one still kind of makes sense, right? Speaking of making sense, while we call this the Fake Smash Ball, a name that doesn't really inspire creativity or explosions, in Japanese it's called the Smash Bomb. This naming scheme works so well because of how similar this looks to Smash Ball in Kana form. Something that you can probably even tell without a single bit of Japanese knowledge, just as long as I placed them together like this. It's just the last Kana that's different. So this naming scheme not only gets the idea across that it's very similar to a Smash Ball and tries to trick you, but it's also able to clarify that it was made in a factory. A bomb factory. It's a bomb. Now, technically, this still could have been called the Smash Bomb in English. The pun wouldn't have been nearly as impactful, but I mean, Smash Bomb and Smash Ball are still somewhat similar. Actually, looking at this language list, it seems pretty split between which ones decide to keep the Smash Bomb wording and which ones just go with the fake Smash Ball route. Most of the ones that go with Smash Bomb are the Asian languages. But I do find it kind of funny how German also goes this route, even though it's kind of in the same boat as English, with the normal item being called the Smash Ball. Ball and Bomb. Okay, maybe with German pronunciation they're more similar, or something at least, I'm not very familiar. Actually, let me just go to Google Translate real quick. Bombe. Ball. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, no, it's the, uh, it's the same boat. But either way, I thought this was really interesting. It makes me wonder if they made this item specifically because of the wordplay in Japanese, or if they had the concept first and the wordplay just came after. By the way, I think fake Smash Ball still works plenty well. It's the same wording scheme used for, say, the fake item box in Mario Kart. So I guess the idea of it being a fake of something normally useful just sort of inherently gets the idea across that it's therefore harmful or something. By the way, again, if you're curious, the fake item box in Mario Kart is just called that in Japanese too. No pun or anything, it's just fake item box. Okay, so before we move on to some more items, first I want to give a quick word to our sponsor ProtonVPN. ProtonVPN is a high-speed, open-source VPN with over 100 million users worldwide. With it, you can protect your browsing activity with no bandwidth limits, and my favorite use is to access geo-blocked content. And ProtonVPN does all of this while ensuring complete privacy because they don't log or share your data with third parties. It even has a built-in ad blocker to shield you from malware, intrusive website trackers, or, you know, just ads. We hate ads, don't we? <laughs> right. You can connect to over 2,900 servers in 68 different countries on all your devices, so you're covered wherever you go. So if you go down to the description, you can download ProtonVPN for free forever to see if the program is right for you. Or eventually you can upgrade to the paid version to get access to the highest speeds and premium features. Again, just click on the link in the description, and thank you ProtonVPN for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so let's look at the wiki for food now. First, it's brought up how the PNGs for the food come from stock images found in various CDs by the company called Sozaijiten. This site here goes over several assets from a number of games that are apparently sourced from these CDs. And here we can see a handful of the food PNGs used from the game. It doesn't seem to be an entirely comprehensive list of them all, at least as far as I can tell, but to give a few examples, here's the steak, here are the pancakes, and here's the salad. 
If you're curious to look for yourself, I'll leave a link to that site down below for you to explore. I know it's kind of obvious that things like this would come from some kind of stock asset, but seeing them in their original form is always really weird and fun to me. I guess it's kind of like seeing a teacher outside of school or something. Next, it may not seem like it's the case, but when you eat a food item, you're actually picking it up before you eat it. You know, because you're very polite and proper. It seems to be about three frames where you're technically holding it before it gets eaten. So of course this means that these three frames can be interrupted, causing you to drop the food, an interaction you might not see a lot. This also seems to be the case for other food-like items like the Maxim Tomato, but for some reason the heart container and the fairy in a bottle both skip any holding animation and just go straight to healing, likely to make them even harder to interrupt and thus more rewarding I guess. If you're curious, Kirby's inhale works a bit similar, yet is still different. There's not really a holding phase here because, you know, he's not really using his arms. He is not polite and proper, but that doesn't mean it can't be interrupted. If you get hit when the food's getting sucked in, but before you've been healed by it, you'll technically drop it, but the food is just... it's just gone. I guess it just fell into Kirby's abyssal stomach, but he didn't get healed because he couldn't savor it. Poor guy. Speaking of eating food, you watching, are you eating food right now? If so, first off, I'm, I'm honored to be chosen as the entertainment for your meal. But second, you should leave a comment of what you're eating. Anyone who's having um, buffalo chicken wings right now is a winner. Okay, no, but seriously, I wanted to point out how the wiki actually organizes all of the food items throughout the entire series, as well as how much percent it heals in each game. You can feel free to visit the page yourself if you're ever curious about a complete comprehensive list, but for a few fun takeaways. The highest healing foods here are the large peaches or large daisies found from Peach and Daisy's Final Smashes respectively, each healing 20%. But obviously those are kind of different from the food item itself and I'm not entirely sure why it's included here. No, the highest healing food item from this is actually the turkey, healing 15%, which is the most healing a food item has ever given in the entire series. Second place is the steak, which heals 12%, and is tied for the drumstick, which only appeared in Brawl. The lowest healing food item is the strawberry in Melee and Brawl, which was then replaced by the cherry for Smash 4 and now in Smash Ultimate, which heals a grand total of 1%. So clearly the range of healing is fairly big, but don't let that give you the impression that cherries are bland because they're actually very special. First of all, when you spawn in a food item, the first frame of it appearing will show it as a cherry. What, you don't see it? Well that's the funny thing, even though I'm using the frame by frame advanced mode, even this doesn't catch it. But by using the power of basic video editing, we can see that for two frames, the item here was a cherry before turning into whatever it was meant to become. A pretty easy takeaway is that this means the cherry is sort of a base for the food items, and given how it heals the least, the idea of it being akin to a placeholder does kind of make sense, right? But it doesn't just end there. Remember, I was in the frame by frame mode for that. Here, just take a look sees. This is what I get when I spam spawn in food normally. A good amount of diversity, right? There's a few repeats within each batch, but we're still cycling through a lot of options in total by doing this. Now let me change the game speed to one half. And now, um, we're getting a, we're getting a lot more cherries this time, aren't we? Like, a lot more. Wait, 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 why, why is, why is this cherry big? Okay, so clearly, by changing the game speed, something kind of got destroyed. It's like the exact opposite issue of the last thing. Here the items start out as whatever they're supposed to be, but then they just turn into a cherry. And it doesn't happen all the time, though I find it happens more consistently both when the speed is even slower and when I take my time spawning them in. Also yes, this still happens even when the speed is higher at 1.5 times, but it seems to happen a little less. Anyways, if you eat these cherries, a big thing you'll notice is that it's not just healing 1%. Here I can tell that this cherry started out as a turkey, and when I eat this cherry, I heal 15%. So even though its visuals are turned into a cherry, mechanically it still seems to be considered whatever food item it was initially. And what about that strangely large cherry? Well every time I looked at what it was before, it always seemed to be a pineapple. So I, I guess for some reason, specifically pineapples will change the cherry's size to be big. 
I mean, maybe there are other examples that I just didn't get in my testing specifically. So biggest takeaway is that cherries are the most important food, the alpha and the omega, and are only hiding their true power with their usual 1% healing. Now, I can't really get concrete explanations for any of this. The most I can conjure up is that this has to do with subframes or something. Because remember that the frame by frame mode didn't really allow the first two cherry frames of an item spawning. I had to see that manually in my video editing program. So maybe by changing the speed of the game, it messes up with the cherry based visuals due to how many frames advance. And maybe that's why the glitch only happens sometimes and happens more frequently the more intensely you've changed the speed. Again, that's just conjecture. I could be completely off, but either way, it's really funny just how broken cherries specifically seem to be. Speaking of items, it's mentioned how you can actually reflect the bob -omb while it's walking. This is a bit of a unique reflect though, as it doesn't boost the damage of his explosion like a normal reflect kind of does. And of course, it doesn't make the bob -omb yours, so you can still be hurt by said explosion. What this does, however, is make it so you do not trigger the explosion during its walk now. Unless, of course, it gets reflected again, which it can. Not an interaction I see a lot, so I just figured that was kind of neat. You know what's even more neat than walking bombs? Doing nothing for over 15 minutes. Yeah, this next prompt brings up how the Cloud Sea of All Rest has the longest stage loop in the entire game. It mentions 15 minutes of duration, so I figured what I could do was just see it for myself. So here, our starting background has the Argentum Trade Guild, with a daytime setting. Well, okay, I mean a bright sky setting, like with blue and stuff. There's no day-night cycle here, since it never really turns night. We just get different sun intensities and stuff. Now, skipping ahead to a little after 6 minutes, you'll see here. We have the same Titan with the same background color and brightness. So, what gives? That's not 15 minutes. Well, if we skip ahead another 6 minutes, you'll see this time, the world tree is in the background. Yeah, there are more moving parts here than just the Titans and the Sun's brightness cycle. This huge tree has always been a factor for the background, even when we couldn't see it. It takes almost 10 minutes for it to naturally appear in frame with this setup, though if you paused and used the in-game camera, you'd be able to see it a bit earlier. Something I covered in that one Appreciating the Little Things video I did a long time ago. You remember that little series? That was fun. So, the cycle of the sun and the titans only really takes 6 minutes and 6 seconds, or thereabouts. Which is still pretty long, but this tree detail means there's technically even more to go. The first instance of the Argentum Titan after the tree goes away is at the 18 minute and 20 second mark. This is where you can consider the background as truly having looped, as both the normal background details and the tree are in the same position as they were at the start. A bit longer than 15 minutes, and definitely way longer than most matches. Like, even the time it takes for the tree to come into a natural visual spot is longer than most competitive matches. The scope really is crazy. And to add even more scope to it, you can look at the very start and this 18 minute loop section and see that the details of the cloud effects are not lined up, even though all of the other background elements are back to normal. And I don't even know if this element can go back to what it was at first, or if it's determined by algorithm and thus random the entire way through. Though feel free to keep the stage going for hours on end to see if everything truly does loop, and let me know down in the comments. Next, while reading through the Find Me wiki and trying some things out, I discovered that if you use something that stops time in the background for a bit, like certain Final Smash activation animations, and use it at the same time the cage gets broken and sent into the sky, you'll see that when time gets paused, the cage simply falls into the abyss right over here, until eventually the Mii plays its star KO animation. That's about it, and just thought that was really dumb and stupid and goofy. If you're curious, the entry that I was testing when I discovered this also involves the time stop thing and destroying the cage, and it states how rarely in doing this when the cage respawns it'll glitch out and spin around continuously, but as much as I tested this for nearly an hour, I couldn't get it to happen once, so oh well. But that's a bit of a lame way to finish off this video, so instead, lastly, I paid a visit to the Death Scythe wiki and found a few fun things there. First up, the special zoom in for the Death Scythe KO gets doubled when used on a buried opponent. Out of curiosity, I tried to see if other insta-KO attacks, like Hero's Thwack, would have the same issue, but it doesn't. So it's a weird thing for the Death Scythe specifically, I guess. And while we've got Hero here, another thing that's weird about the Death Scythe is how its charge sound effect works for him. Normally, his charge sounds like this. 
Note, the thing I'm talking about here isn't Hero's unique, gamey sound that's added to his charge, I mean the general sound. This one is usually reserved for sword-related smash attacks, as you can see with Mars and Roy. It sounds like this for all of the other battering items too, even if said item isn't a sword. Yet for the Death Scythe, as well as the Killing Edge, it sounds like this. This is more like the generic Smash Charge sound, which is doubly funny considering these are both blades. It's not like these are the universal sounds for these though, as if we go back to Marth and Roy, we'll see that they don't override the normal sound effect. No idea if Hero's unique additional charge attack sound has anything to do with this, or if it's just a coincidental bug, but either way that's very interesting and also a great place to end today's video! Yeah, I know that some people thought that this series was done when I released my supercut of it, despite the fact that I keep saying that I want to use the format in other ways in the future, so I hope y'all are happy to see it back. I really like this format, it's not really something you see anyone else do, and I've learned a lot of cool stuff by doing this, so expect it to be a channel staple, alongside normal random facts, especially now that I'm not forcing myself into any specific theming or anything. Obviously, if you have any suggestions or questions, leave them down in the comments. If you have anything from any Smash Wiki that you know about, be sure to tell me where you're citing it from, since really the only difference between this series and my Random Facts series is where I'm getting my information from. Does that warrant a different series name? Maybe not, but that's why I decided to add the word random to the title of this one too. So it all, it all makes sense. Anyways, that's all. I'm done and I'm going to go get ready to go on vacation at the beach. Oh, but uh, not before I thank my distinguished fantabulous patrons, Sylvian700, Burbo, Isaac Bragna, Spider Jew, and everyone else for the support. Stay casual, and I'll see y'all later.